of mine. Okay, now I'm happy. Praise the Lord. What an honor and a privilege to be able to share my heart with you. Um, let me ask again real quick. If you do not have sermon notes, raise your hand real high, and one of these wonderful ushers will get you a copy of the notes so we can follow along quicker. Um, raise your hand real high. <laughs> While they're doing that also, let me just uh, once again remind you that if you're interested in the Tape of the Month uh, uh, ministries, there's a form like this on the back table at my table. And again, at conferences and only at conferences, um, if you'll just sign up for one month for $15, I'll give you $10 credit toward anything back there. So, you know, you can't hardly lose on that. I mean, <laughs> obviously I'm not making any money on that. But if I, I really have a passion to put into you and into leaders across America, um, some good quality leadership material. And uh, again, if you sign up for a quarter for $45, I give you $20 credit. And uh, a year is $150, you save 30 bucks on that, and then I'll give you $30 credit on that, uh, in addition to that. So you get to save 60 bucks if you like. But I uh, want to let you be aware of that. <clears throat> I, am, I am so excited about the opportunity and I just feel I feel like I'm about to explode I have so much inside of me so I'm not going to go into a lot of um, hooplas just know that I love Pastor Van and what he and Sister Dana are doing at our church I wouldn't want anybody else to be children's pastors um, they're doing a tremendous job and it makes my job so much more wonderful Father, I thank you for the honor and the privilege to speak to your choicest of people. Father, we thank you for senior pastors. We thank you, Lord, for evangelists. We thank you, Lord, for apostles and prophets and teachers. But, Lord, I believe that some of the choicest in the kingdom of God are right here, those who work with our children. Father, I ask that you give me a word to speak that will bring value to their life, hope, and fresh vision to their ministry. Lord, let us glorify you in everything. Lord, I ask for your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. If you will, I want you to turn your Bibles to Esther chapter 4 very quickly. And we're going to read a portion of Scripture that is very familiar with you, but I'm going to come from it from a total different vein today. And um, do me one other favor. Another quirk that I have is as soon as everybody's in, can we close all the doors? I'm, do y'all have quirks? I got quirks. You know, I'm almost like... You know, I can't function unless, <laughs> if you don't have a quirk, pray for us that do. Um, <clears throat> actually, you do, you just don't know you do. Ephesians, uh, Esther, excuse me, Esther chapter 4. Did I say Ephesians? Esther, I'm sorry, Esther chapter 4. Verse 12, and when Esther's word, words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that just because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows but that you've come to the royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, and even though it is against the law, I said even though it is against the law, and even if I perish, I perish. I want to share with you a message that's simply entitled Creating Royalty out of rubbish. In your notes, normally when one mentions Esther, most, imme most immediately think about the famous statement, who knows whether you've come to the kingdom of God for such a time as this, and how Esther risked her life to save her people. But we probably have overlooked the true hero of this book. The true hero of the book of Esther is not Esther, but her older cousin, Mordecai. I will prove that to you today, and it's very important because you and I are the Mordecais of this generation. I am, I'm about fed up to hear, listening to my peers and listening to church people point at the young people and say, 
you are the ones that's going to have to change the world. I believe that it's the youth that's going to spearhead revival. It's always been that way. I believe, it, uh, I believe it's going to be our children. But they cannot do it without the adults. Esther, yes, Esther was the one who stuck her neck out that day, that very famous day when she stood before the king. But there was a whole lot more to it than what Esther did. It was because of what Mordecai did. Let me lay down a little bit of groundwork. I mentioned this a while ago as in my short talk with you, but I want you to get it in your notes. For the last several years, when someone spoke of the necessity of reaching the lost, you often heard them speak of the 1040 window. But now the evangelical church is referring to the 414 window. Because the vast majority of the lost in the world today are between the ages of 4 and 14 years old. Specialists are now saying that the majority that accept Christ do so by the age of 12. No longer the old statistic of the age 18 years old. Which says to me, children's pastors, children workers, that says to me that by the time they get to me, it's almost too late. And it's imperative for, for you to recognize the value in which you have in your church. I know that, you know, oftentimes children's pastors and youth pastors, probably children's pastors even more so than youth pastors, we kind of get overlooked. You know, you have Pastor Appreciation Day and they buy the pastor a new Cadillac. <laughs> for us, at best, they might toilet paper our house. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this morning, true story, this morning I wake up. And I have, all, you know, right now it's election time. One of my, some of my young people just decided to show me their love last night. I woke up this morning with 50 voting signs. I mean, I'm voting for people I don't even know. I have all these voting signs. I'm sitting there going, they're going to get me arrested. You know what I'm saying? They just want, I guess they just went down, down the road. And there's one. And they picked up all these signs. They also had like 10 house for sale signs. I'm sitting there, oh, Jesus. That's called love. <laughs> and we many times get overlooked the older brother syndrome that Pastor Van was talking about. But let me tell you something. You are the most valuable in the kingdom of God. I believe that with all my heart. And I will show you that in the book of, Mordecai, uh, in the book of Esther with Mordecai. I want, you to, I want you to understand that today's media, we need to realize that today's media, and this is hot off the presses, friend, Today's media is now geared going after the six-year-old with their advertisement. And they believe that if they can capture the heart of a six-year-old, they've got them for life. How much more should we be investing our time, money, and energy in our six-year-olds in, in our churches? We have a, a gospel that needs to be implanted into them. And yes, in your notes, God has always used the youth to do great exploits. However, they could not do it without the assistance and the help of the adults. And what happened in the book of Esther is a result of two generations coming together and working together for the kingdom of God. Esther would have never done what she did if it was not for Mordecai, and I'll prove it to you. In your notes, just jot it down. There is no success without a successor. And our number one job is not to grow large children's ministries or youth ministries. Our number one job is to touch a life, find the giftings and the callings that Pastor Van referred to, develop them and make them into the godly leaders that God's wanting to use, not 10, 15 years from now, but today. How did Mordecai establish Esther's success? Well, there's four main points, and I'm just going to warn you, the first one's going to take most of our time, so don't freak out whenever you see 30 minutes later we're still on point number one. And I have a hunch, I wasn't here last night, but I have a hunch that I'm going to be fitting like a glove with what happened last night. Number one is this. How did he establish her success? He adopted her as his very own daughter. See, in Esther chapter 2, verse 7, and it's in your notes, Mordecai, Mordecai had a cousin named Hadesa, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. 
And this girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features. And Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when his father and mother died. Now, so what we have here is we have Esther, who's just a child. How old she is, we're not sure, but she's just a child. And her older cousin, Mordecai, adopts her because she's fatherless and motherless. And you know she can jot it down. We had better wake up and recognize that we are dealing with a fatherless generation. In fact, I just, just a couple of weeks ago, I delivered a message to my leaders because I want them to understand, we need to understand the group of people that we're reaching out to. And I did a message and, and I asked my wife and my assistant to make several copies of it and it's back there on the table. And I highly recommend you get it. It's a message entitled, A Fatherless Generation. Because I share in that how sad that statement is. In Proverbs 17, 6, in your notes, it says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of the children are their... The glory of the children are their fathers. You realize because we're dealing with a fatherless generation... We are dealing with a generation that has no glory. They have nothing to live for. They don't know who they are. Everybody is obsessed with their family tree. Why are we obsessed with our family tree? Because we want to know who we are. And when we take away their glory, they have nothing to live for. And that's the reason why our children are in the state in which we are in, uh, they are in. It's because we have, we have allowed the devil by ripping up families and homes, do you realize the, the divorce rate in, among Christians is higher than among atheists? It's the truth. George Barnum just came out with recent statistics in America. Divorce rate among evangelical Christians is 27%. Divorce rate among Assembly of God members is 27%. The divorce rate among atheists is 24%. The divorce rate in our churches is higher than the divorce rate among atheists. And our homes are being stripped apart. The, the home was the very first institution of God, not the church. Church wasn't born until Acts chapter 2. And everything is built upon the institution of the home. And the devil understands that. And that's why he has been destroying the homes. And you and I can't do our job effectively unless we begin to minister to the families. I was so excited because Pastor Vanny and I didn't even talk, have not even talked. But last week, you can ask my staff, last week my staff and I went off for a day, an entire day, and ask God for a fresh vision and fresh focus and a fresh set of core values. We have five core values that we're adopting for our, for our, our youth ministry. You know what the number one core value was? Family. And I told my staff, even this last Sunday, I told my, my leaders, we've got, to stop, we've got to start thinking differently in our ministries. I do not minister to teenagers. I minister to families who have teenagers. You do not minister to children alone. You minister to families who have children in their ranks. And we've got to change our way of thinking because we are separating our families as much as anybody else. You got, your, you got mother's ministry on this night, and you got dad's ministry on this other night. We got children's ministry on this other day. And we have youth ministry on this other day. And they know they can't have dinner together because there's always a ministry going on for one of them. We need to start developing family ministries. I'll amen myself if you're not going to. It's the truth. And, and, and we are dealing with a fatherless generation. In your notes, jot it down. The expression of fatherless generation is possibly one of the saddest statements that one can make. No wonder Jesus uh, had in Psalm 68, 5, the Lord said, He is a father to the fatherless and a defender of the widows is God in his holy place. At the beginning of the year, I started the year with an extended fast and, and uh, because I'm just, I'm just ready for to go to the next level, whatever that is. And, 
And um, Pastor Van was referring earlier about he believes that this generation will lay hands upon the dead and see them rise. And, and, and we talk like that around here a lot. I'm glad I'm a part of a church that talks about wanting to see eyes open and ears open and cripples walk and dead rise. You know, I, I believe it's time for us to start talking that way. But you know what? We got to go beyond just talking. And so, you know, I, I'm, I was on this extended fast and I'm doing everything I can within my power to make sure that I'm in a position that God could use me. And uh, so I just, I just, I found, I found something very interesting because I thought, I got to thinking, you know, about this raising the dead. And so I went to the Bible and I, I said, okay, where's the very first place? I'm getting away from my notes, but you're going to want to take notes here. Where's the very first place where someone was raised from the dead? Because usually the very first time a concept is introduced into the Bible, whether it's a, a commandment or, or what, uh, you know, a teaching, there's usually, that's usually where the Lord lays down a foundation for that concept. Okay? So I said, okay, where's the very first place where someone was raised from the dead? And it's found in, sec, in 1 Kings chapter 7, 17, verse 17. 1 Kings 17. Verse 17, and it happened with a man named Elijah, and this is interesting. You know the very first person that was ever raised from the dead was a boy? Hello. The very first person that was raised from the dead was a boy. You, you'll, account, you'll account it was a widow's son, remember? And the widow who, who, who had given of her, of her meal and her oil and it just kept producing, it was her son that had died. And, and whenever, whenever the boy died, she went and got Elijah. And Elijah, the Bible says, Elijah carried the boy up to his bed chambers, placed him on his bed, and he laid upon him. And God brought him back to life. You know what? Our children need somebody who will take them from the pits in which they live and carry them up to the prayer chambers and lay down their life for them that they might have life. I looked at the second account. You know the second account? The second account, exact same thing, is found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 16 and following, with Elisha. Guess who Elisha raises from the dead? A boy. You recount the story. In Elisha chapter 4, it says that, a, that there was a rich widow. I mean, excuse me, a rich woman. She wasn't a widow. She had a deadbeat dad. I'll show it to you in just a minute. A rich woman. And Elisha came through there all the time. She said to her husband, she said, you know, the man of God comes through here all the time. Let's build a room for him that he might have a place to stay. Remember? And the Bible says she was well off. Look it up. It says she was well off, friend. She was rich. And they built this room for him. And Elisha goes, you know what? You've been so kind to me. What could I do for you? And she says, I don't need anything. Ah, he goes, ah, 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 you don't have any children. He says, this time next year, you're going to have a son. And she says, don't you play with my affections, man of God. He says, no, you're going to have a son. If you look at the story, you can look it up later on. It says that she gave birth to a son, and some years later, the boy, he was a boy, the boy went out to the field where his dad was working. And the boy goes, my head, my head. And deadbeat dad doesn't have time to stop working long enough to take care of his son. So what he says is, take him to mama. They take the boy to mama, and the Bible says that the boy died in mama's lap. You know why? Because daddy wasn't taking care of the boy. The Bible then says she took the boy laid him on the man of God's bed, and she went to her husband, and she said this. She said, I need to borrow a donkey because I need to go see the man of God. She didn't even bother telling him that the boy was dead. She didn't even tell her husband that his son had died. You know why? Because he's a deadbeat dad. He couldn't do anything about it anyway. He was spiritually dead. She had to go somewhere else to get the answer to her son's miracle. And she says, she says, I need a donkey. I need to go see the man of God. Look it up. He goes, he goes, it's not Easter. It's not Christmas. What are you talking about? What are you going to go see the man of God for? It's no special occasion. 
And she says, everything's fine. Just let me buy up a donkey. I need to go see the man of God. So she gets on the donkey. She goes to see Elisha. And Elisha, Elisha sees her a long way off. And he says, there, there's, there's the woman who always puts me up in her home. He sends his servant, okay, to go find out what's wrong. And, um, and she says, everything's fine. She says, everything's fine. She comes up to where Elisha was, and the Bible says she gets down, and she begins to grab Elisha's feet and cries, uncontrol un uh, I mean, just uncontrollably. And Elisha was a prophet, so he had very deep insight. And he said, there's something wrong with her. <laughs> but I wish, I wish more prophets today would be as honest as Elisha was, because he then said, but I don't know what it is. Sometimes we go on and say things that we really don't know. You know, it's okay to say I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, <clears throat> we're not, this isn't a prophet conference, but anyway. He said, there's something wrong with her, but I don't know what it is. And, uh, and she says, my boy died. The boy you said I'd have, he's dead. And he hands his rod to his servant. He says, run to the house and put my rod upon his body. And so the servant takes off. But you know what? Mama doesn't let go of Elisha's ankle. She says, uh-uh, Jack. You're not going to send your rod with somebody else to go take care of my boy. You are coming. Let me tell you something. We need to, listen, if we're going to raise a dead generation, we can't pass the baton off to of somebody else. We're going to have to do it ourselves. And she says, uh-uh, you're coming to my house. And so she drags Elisha to the house. And the Bible says this. He goes up. And it's interesting, he did just like the first, first person. The Bible says he laid on the dead boy, just like Elijah. And the Bible says this. It says he put his eyes upon his eyes, his hands upon his hands, and his mouth upon his mouth. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been in a dead corpse. I've seen a dead corpse before. We're talking eerie city here. Can you imagine cold, clammy, blue, probably? They didn't have nice embalming, you know, and makeup. We're talking, and he, and he goes, and he puts his hands upon his hands, his cold, clammy hands. He puts his eyes on his eyes, puts his mouth on his mouth. And I go, no! You don't know what he died of, boy! You don't go putting your mouth on a dead corpse's mouth. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, Richard, if we're going to raise this generation, we're going to have to get out of our comfort zone. And the Lord spoke to me, and this is what he said. Put your mouth upon his mouth. You know what that is? We've got to breathe life into this generation. We've got to breathe hope into them. Even in our Christian homes, so many of our children... So many of our teenagers hear nothing but cursing and slandering and, and why can't you be like so-and-so and why can't you do this and why don't you do that? Constantly and talked down to and badgered and bruised. Even if we don't use curse words, we still curse them. They need someone to breathe life into them and hope and salvation. That's, that's, the, that's the mouth. The eyes are obvious. After, listen, it's not just enough to get someone born again. We've got to do, as Pastor Van said earlier, we've got to, we, we've got to then give them vision, purpose. Listen, otherwise they're going to grow up to be just like their parents, deadbeat Christians sitting in pews doing nothing more but warming 18 inches and paying their tithes and thinking they're loving Jesus. They're bored to death because they're not fulfilling the call of God upon their life. We've got to impart vision into our children but then his hands upon their hands. You know what that is? We've got to train their hands for war. Listen, some of us are really great motivators. But you know what? If all we do is motivate them, but we don't mobilize them, we may as well just leave them dead. Because there's nothing more frustrating than to plant a vision inside of somebody and then they don't have anybody to train them how to do it. We've got to train their hands for war. Listen to me, we're dealing with I find it interesting, talking about a fatherless generation, I find it interesting, not only are the first two accounts of someone being raised from the dead children, but the first account was a fatherless child. The second one was a deadbeat dad. That's what we're dealing with. That's what we're dealing with. 
And God is calling us to, to, to reach out to this fatherless generation and minister to them. In your notes, follow along with me. Susan Mitchell said this. Susan Mitchell suggests that the introduction... By the way, she was a uh, uh, fourth grade teacher. She suggests that the introductory question of children of the boomer generation was, what does your father do for a living? But she proposes that the question for today's children is, does your daddy live with you? Jay Strack and Ron Luce in, in their book, Turning the Hearts of the Fathers, um, said this statistic. One of the latest studies reveals that many young people today spend 50% of their time on their own with no adult supervision. This generation realizes they don't have to be alone anymore, especially with the Internet so accessible. Kids are hungry for a father. You'll never understand this generation's rebellion, resentment, restlessness, anger, aloofness, and distance until you understand this fact. I was blown away a couple weeks ago when Josh McDowell made this statement. More children live without fathers in America, 25 million, than in any other nation of the world. Are you hearing me? More children live without their fathers in America than in any other nation of the world. Josh McDowell made this statement. He said, and this is for us today, to be successful in youth ministry, and I'm going to add children's ministry, in the next seven to ten years, youth ministers are going to have to help parents connect with their teenagers. They are disconnected. Statistics prove, and I'm moving quickly, statistics prove that there is a direct correlation between poor relationships with parents and teens involved in crime. A direct relation. Let me give you three statistics to prove that. Teens from a single parent home are 30% more likely to get involved with drugs, sex, and crime. 30% more likely if they're from a single-parent home. The second one's the one that scares me. Teenagers from a two-parent home with poor relationships. In other words, they don't have a good relationship with their parents. Both parents are home, but they don't have good relationships. Are 68% more likely to get involved with drugs, sex, and crime. In other words, it'd be better for them to be in a one-parent home with a good relationship than to be in a two-parent home with a poor relationship. Josh McDowell spends hundreds of thousands of dollars in research every year. And, um, and he, this thing with uh, Columbine just really messed him up. And he did a lot of research. And they, 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 they studied all the school shootings in the last couple of years that's happened in our nation. And they found one common thread among all of them. They were all white males from two-parent homes that appeared to be the picture of an American home, but they all had terrible relationships with their parents, especially their dad. The only common thread that they could find. Let me just stop here while I'm thinking about it. I asked Josh, I grabbed him in between sessions, and I said, listen, talk to me, because he's a lot older and a lot more mature than I am. Been in, been in this business a lot longer. I said, what's the number one important thing that we need as, as youth pastors? What's the number one thing for a successful youth ministry? You know what he told me? A happy marriage. Number two, you know what it was? We need to get the sin out. Recent surveys prove that 50% of our youth pastors, and I don't think it's going to be much different with children's pastors, 50% of our youth pastors are hooked on pornography on the internet. Proven fact, 50%. No wonder our children are sexually involved. Because when I or you get in this pulpit and we preach, we can preach the word of God, but how many of you realize the spirit that we possess is also going out? He said, the number two thing, we've got to deal with this pornography situation on the Internet. And number three, we've got to help parents connect with their children. Make, it, make that connection. Well, let me move on. 68% of teenagers, excuse me, 
Teenagers in two-parent homes with poor relationships are 68% more likely to get involved in sex, crimes, and drugs. But here's the st statistic that I love. And dads, listen up to me. Teens from a two-parent home with a good relationship with their parents, especially dad, are 94% less likely to get involved in drug, sex, and alcohol, uh, crime. And I say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. A few more statistics, and I don't want to bore you with statistics, but we need to understand the day we live in. Half, one half of the children in the United States will experience the breakup of their parents' marriage in their childhood. One half of them. And one-tenth will suffer through three divorces during their childhood. One-tenth of, and that means every tenth child will go through three divorces before they turn 18 years old. And we wonder why they're in the condition they're in. The average dad, now this one burns me, friend. The average American dad gives only 35 seconds of undivided attention to his child each day. And we wonder why we have a generation that's so messed up. 35 seconds a day a meaningful conversation. This is not me. These are, these are statistics that are, I can bonify every one of these statistics from legit sources. 35% of families are told what we refer to as total TV households. That means that they are on all afternoon, dinner time, and all evening. In other words, 35% of our families, when that child comes home from school or that dad or mom comes home from work, the first thing that goes on is the light switch so they can see the switch on the TV. Boop. And from the moment they get home to the moment they go to bed, they're glued in front of the TV set. 35% of our homes are that way. In other words, absolutely no communication. We're dealing with a fatherless generation. We're dealing with a fatherless generation. In your notes, our homes have become nothing more than a hotel for relatives instead of a haven for relationships. Our homes are nothing more than a hotel for relatives. We come in, we come in, where's dinner at? It's on the stove. Thanks, Mom. We serve our own dish. We sit down in front of our TV set. Mom, did you do the clothes? Yeah, we got the clothes. The bed made? Yeah, the bed's made because that's all taken care of the hotel. Got clean towels? Yes, clean towels. All we do is sleep and eat in our homes, kiss each other on the way out the door if we do that. We're dealing with a fatherless generation. And the urgent cry of the hour, and I want you to hear my heart this morning, the urgent cry and the urgent need of this hour is for spiritual parents. Let me tell you something. Esther was rubbish. She was trash. She had no hope. Mom and dad were dead and gone. She, she, was, she had no future. Turn her over to the government. Put her in. Put her into the, you know, foster homes and let her bounce from one foster home to the next. Just two weeks ago, I visited a young lady, 12 years old. You know where she was at? In the juvenile hall. And, it's not, and she's so familiar with it because she's been there several times. But she has no mom. She has no dad. And she's been bounced from foster home to foster home all her life. And I walked in there, and I have to be honest with you, I wasn't comfortable. I've been there a few times, but I just, I'm not comfortable there. And I, and, and, and I went in there, and, and here she is, 12 years old. She's not this big in there with all these 15, 16-year-old girls, some of them older than that. Who knows what they're in there for? And this girl's been abused. This little girl's been abused sexually. She's so messed up sexually, it's not even funny. You can't even let her alone with other, other kids her age because she just acts out things that have been done to her. And, and so hurt, doesn't trust anybody. She takes any foster mom that will have her for any time. And, the next, and within a couple of months, she's got mom in a chokehold, got bruises all around her neck, wanting to kill her. She's, got, she's actually got murder accounts against her. Attempted murder. She's being held underneath attempted murder. 
And I walk in there, and what do you say? Let me tell you what she needed that moment. She didn't need any advice. She knows right from wrong. You know what you're doing wrong, even, when, even if you've never had it trained to you. She didn't need me to go in there and lecture her and give her some sermon. I went in there, and I held her in my arms right there in front of all those other girls. And I started crying, and I said, oh, Lisa. I said, oh, sweetheart, I said, I don't want to embarrass you. You know, and, 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 because it's just one big room. And we're right there with all the girls, right there in front of all of them. And I started crying. I said, I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry, sweetheart. I don't want to embarrass you in front of your peers. And she said, no, Brother Richard. She says, it's fine. And she started crying with me. And I just held her and I just said, listen, sweetheart, I'm sorry you've been dealt this, you know, what, what you have to deal with is not fair. You've been dealt a bad hand. And sweetheart, I can't be your daddy. I can't be your daddy, but you know what? If you let me, I'd love to be your spiritual daddy. I'd love to. In fact, if you want to, you can call me daddy. She got out just a couple days later, and for the last two or three weeks now, probably about three weeks, she's, she runs up to me every service. Hey, Dad! You know, all she needs is just a spiritual daddy, someone who will believe in her, someone who will, who will look beyond all the all the crud that's on her that's obvious. She just got suspended last week, you know, because one of the teachers said her grade out loud and she got embarrassed, so she led off into the teacher, you know. She, listen, what do we expect her to do? She led off, you know, and so she suspended for two days. So you know what she did? She came up here and worked at the church for two days in the youth department, you know, just cleaning the refrigerator and, you know, folding papers and, and I just loved on her. I said, you know, sweetheart, you know, <laughs> it wasn't the smartest thing, was it? No, 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 no. But, you know, I love you. You know, it's okay. It's all right. We'll do better next time, won't we? Yeah. You need a spiritual dad. This generation so desperately needs so much more than a sermon. They just need a, a man or a woman who will love them unconditionally with a godly love and say, you know, I believe in you. See, the urgent need of this hour with our generation is for spiritual parents. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.15. He said, even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father. Through the gospel, therefore I urge you, to imitate me. You know, if we'll love them unconditionally, you know what will happen? They'll end up imitating us. <laughs> I love it whenever I see my young people imitate me. It's the greatest compliment that you could give to me is to mock me, to imitate me. I love Winky Pretney, and I love what he said, and I put his quote in here. He said, people always wonder why someone as ancient as I am is still working with young people. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I tell them, I'm no dummy. I know where the next revival is going to hit. It's with the young. Why would I want to start grannies for God now? <laughs> Love you, Winky. Recently, someone said to me, Winky Prattney, I thought you were already dead. <laughs> That's encouraging. Then I told them about Simeon. This old man staggers in and out of the temple. Thousands of babies have come through there in his lifetime. And one day, Simeon sees a very ordinary carpenter couple, and he asks to hug their baby and says, Now I can depart, for I've seen the Lord's Messiah. And then Winky said these, Before I die, I just want to hug this next generation. I just want to hug this next generation. Let me tell you what. Mordecai took Esther, who was nothing but rubbish, she was nothing but throw her away to the government. He didn't have to do it. He was a cousin. But he took her in his home, and he loved her unconditionally. He raised her in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, and he trained her up. Let me tell you what. She would have never stuck her neck out before the king if it wasn't for cousin Mordecai, who raised her up with some guts for the gospel. Well, the second thing I see in this portion of Scripture, and boy, I really challenge you to go back through Esther and read it again. 
The second thing I see in Mordecai is Mordecai was a man of authority and used it properly in governing Esther's life. Mordecai was a man of authority. How do I know that? Well, Esther 2, 19 says that Mordecai sit, was sitting at the king's gate. You just, anybody didn't sit at the king's gate. You had uh, those, if you know anything about biblical times, the authorities of the city would sit at the city's gate. And Mordecai was a man of authority. And he used that authority. Listen, God has given you and me authority to speak into young people's lives. Let us use it wisely. He used that God-given authority to form and shape and mold and direct Esther so that when her time did come, she was ready to fulfill her call. And he used that to form her and fashion her. I love what Tom Rainer said. He said, though children have outwardly cried for freedom, inwardly they desire boundaries, standards, and even rules. Just a couple of months ago, May 8th issue, year 2000 of New Newsweek magazine, quote from a 17-year-old young man, there is a hunger for guidelines in my generation that parents haven't offered. See, there's three purposes for authority because of time's sake. I'm not going to stay here very long. But there's three purposes for authority that you and I need to constantly remember. Number one, or A, is we, are, we have authority to protect. It is our obligation to protect our children. That means everything from screening your workers. Let me tell you something. If you don't screen your workers, you shame on you. You're setting yourself up for a lawsuit one day. Because there's perverts all across our nation and in our churches that are looking for opportunities to get their hands on children. Possibly there's some even among us today. That's the reason why before you work in our department, and I'm sure in vans as well, there's a three-page three -page application that you have to fill out with um, three personal references. We do fingerprinting and a criminal check on you before I even have a conversation with you. And you better do that, because if you're not, you're, gonna, you're asking for trouble. But it, our authority is there to protect them. The second thing is to correct them. And we can correct them in such a way as not to destroy their tender spirit. I'm an avid believer. In fact, I, one of my favorite teachings is back there on that table. Caring enough to confront. It's a lesson that the church world needs to hear. The bottom line is this, most preachers don't confront people when they're in sin. Oh, they'll do it from the pulpit. They'll hide back here and do it. But they get outside the pulpit and they're a bunch of wimpy people and they won't confront people in sin. And the reason, the bottom line is this, the reason we don't confront people in sin is because we care more about ourselves than we do about them. We don't want to be hurt. We don't want to be disliked. We don't want to be misunderstood. Well, then... Forfeit your pulpit and go get you a secular job. You're not worthy of being a man of God. But see, I'm, I'm an avid believer that whenever I get through confronting you and calling you into my office, it's a big joke around my staff because they, they, it's a big joke because after I get through whipping one of my teenagers, so to speak, and they leave my office, they're grinning from ear to ear. And they go, Brother Richard hasn't talked to you yet, have they? They go, oh, yes, he has. Hey, you mean he, he talked to you about, oh, yeah, isn't he wonderful? I'm an avid believer that whenever you get through correcting somebody, they should love you more afterwards than they did before. I don't know about you, but when God whips me, I go, oh, that felt so good. Doesn't it? Doesn't it feel good to know that you're loved enough that God cares enough to confront you? But see, God has given us authority to correct them, and if we do it right... Hello, if we do it right, we don't have to badger them and bruise them and leave them wounded for life. It should be a healing experience. And the third purpose of that authority is to direct them. And let us never forget, as I said last year, God's called us to keep feed the lambs first and then the sheep. And let us never forget that we are dealing with sheep. And you don't drive sheep, you lead sheep. We direct them by our own personal lives. Let me move on. He was a man of authority. Three, Mordecai was a man of authority because he was a man of intercessory prayer and fasting. I've got to say this. 
Listen, this is an hour when we have got to get on our face in intercessory prayer and fasting. The Lord spoke to me a year and a half ago and said, Richard, any man who doesn't intercede for his people has no divine mandate to preach to his people. The greatest thing that we do for our children, one of the greatest things, is to get on our face every morning in intercessory prayer. In Esther 4, 1, it says, When Mordecai learned of all that, he, this, that had been done, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and went into the city wailing loudly and bitterly. And then in, in chapter 4, verses 15 and 18, Esther parrots back to him, I believe what she's always heard him say. And she says, okay, I'm going to do this, but you get a bunch of people together and you start fasting and praying. Now, where did she get that from? I think she got it from Mordecai, who raised her and taught her the value of prayer and fasting. See, he got his authority from prayer and fasting. Let us not forget, Romans 13, 1 says, that we should submit ourselves to governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Let me tell you something, children's pastors, youth pastors, listen to me. Our number one goal is not to be our children's friend. It's to be their pastor. I really don't give a rip if my teenagers like me or not. Now, I do. Okay, let's be honest. I do, but that's not my goal. My goal is I want them to respect me. And, and, and you can talk to any of my teenagers, okay? They respect me, buddy. They don't back talk me. You know, they don't do Whenever I tell them to do something, they do something, and it's not out of fear and trembling. Oh, oh God. No. It's out of loving respect. Let me tell you where that comes from. It comes from a prayer closet. And I don't mind telling you, and I don't do that boastfully. I'm just telling you the way it is. You can hear two different men get up in a pulpit and preach the same message. One will hit you like a brick, and the other one puts you to sleep. Why? Prayer closet. Prayer closet. Many of us want to walk in authority, but we don't want to pay the time, pay the price in the prayer closet. We want to dance on our wives' prayers. <laughs> Mordecai was a man of authority. Why? Because he was a man of intercessory prayer and fasting. Number four, Mordecai, um, excuse me, Mordecai rebuked. And instructed Esther with words of faith and encouragement. I want to show you something probably that you've never seen before. At least I didn't until the Lord unfolded this to me. Go back to Esther 4. Hopefully you still got it there. And go back just a few verses before where we read at the beginning. And um, Esther chapter 4, verse 8. Look at this. It says, he also, this is Mordecai, also gave a copy of the text of the, um, I can't ever say that word. Say it for me. Eat it. Thank you. For their annihilation. In other words, the decree for the annihilation, which had been published in Susa to show to Esther and explain to her. And he told him to urge her to go into the king's presence, to beg for mercy and to plead with him for her people. Okay. Now let me, let me, let me explain to you what just happened. Mordecai took the decree that, that showed that the Jews were supposed to be killed. He gave it to his servant, and he says, go to the king's palace, give it to Esther, let her see it, and tell her she's got to go plead for mercy. Okay? So, Hathach, who was his servant, verse 9, went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Okay? He, he went and said, Mordecai said, you've got to go before the king and plead. Verse 10. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, this is her response, all the king's officials and the people of the royal province know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that he be put to death. The only exception to this is for the king to extend the golden scepter to him and to spare his life. But 30 days have passed since I have been called to go to the king. In other words, just put it real short, she said, No! She said, she said to him, she said, she said, now, oh, whoa, whoa, you need to go tell cousin Mordecai something. He doesn't understand how it works in the kingdom. I just can't go prouncing in before the king anytime I want to. If I do, I'll get killed. She goes, you need to go explain that to him. I can't do this. Okay? You see it? Some of you do. Some of you are going, are you really? 
That's what she said. She says, I can't do that. Look at this, verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Okay? See, we have this mentality that Mordecai said, go do this. She goes, okay. Uh-uh. They were fighting about this thing. And, and, and she, he gets the word back. She says, no. And he sends back this answer. Do not think, Esther, that because you are in the king's house, that you alone of all the Jews will escape. He said, for if you remain silent this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. In other words, what's he doing? He's rebuking the snot out of her. He's saying, Esther, you don't understand, sweetheart. You're dead meat anyway. You have nothing to lose. You're dead anyway. You think just because you live in the king's palace that you're going to be escaped? No way. He rebukes her. And then he encourages her. Look at this. He says, and who knows, Esther, but all these years that I've been pouring into you, and I've been training you, and I've been equipping you, and I've been loving you, who knows but that you have come to the kingdom of God for such a time as this. Everything that I've been pouring into you, Esther, it was for this moment. And he speaks these words of encouragement to her and faith. And he goes, you can do it, Esther. I see it inside of you. And then she replies, okay, but you better fast. <laughs> you better pray because I'm going against the law. But if I perish, I perish. Wow. See, see he rebuked her. But yet he encouraged her. I like Titus 2.15 in your notes. These then are the things that you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Number five. Number five. Mordecai's convictions were caught, not taught. Where in the world does Mordecai get off? And telling his niece that, that she is to go stick her neck on the line. When she comes back with a report, I can't do that, he'll kill me. Where does he have the audacity to say, Esther, you got to do it anyway? You know what? I get real irked many times with my peers is this. As youth pastors, many times we'll tell our young people, go win your school for Jesus. Witness, 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 do this, do that. And we don't even do it ourselves. Where do we get off on doing that to our teenagers? Where do, we, where, do we, where do we get the authority and the right to tell her? Where does Mordecai get the right to even ask Esther to die for the cause? I'll tell you how. Because if you look to chapter before, and I got the references in there for you. If you look to chapter before, we see cousin Mordecai standing in the street. And Haman comes down and everybody's bowing. And Mordecai goes, uh-uh, not me. I bow down to no man but the Lord my God. And he could have been beheaded right there on the spot. And don't you think that Esther, when she got report back from her cousin, you've got to stick your neck out. Esther thought back. I remember Mordecai doing that. Oh, I remember him standing up for his convictions. And because he stood up for his convictions, I can stand up for my convictions. Let me tell you something. Our young people, I believe, are going to shake this nation. But they're not going to do it without us. We can't sit in our duff and point our finger and say, go change our nation. We've got to lead the way. Mordecai's conviction was not something that he taught her. It was something that she caught as she observed his life. And look at the wonderful results of what happened because of Mordecai's ministry. I won't go through that. You can read it yourself. But because of time's sake, let me just say this. Go back and read the last chapter of Esther. It's amazing. The last chapter, chapter 10, doesn't even say one word about Esther. Not the first word. The entire chapter talks about Mordecai how great he was, and the powerful things that he had done for the kingdom of God. Let me tell you what, I thank God for Esther. I thank God for Esther, powerful woman of God. But let me tell you who the real hero was. It was Mordecai. 
Listen to me, children's pastor. So many times you're put last on the totem pole, and you can feel like nothing more than a glorified Sunday school teacher. But let me tell you something. You're the Mordecai's and the hope for this generation. And if we don't do it, if we don't do it, we're sacrificing our children. I want to close by reading a story that just shows the need of the hour and the simplicity that it will take for us to change a generation. It's an article taken from the Red Book magazine, and it's entitled, Why I'm Every Mother's Worst Fear. I'm not going to read the entire article, but I want to read several paragraphs out of it. It says this, by the way, it was written, it was written by a pedophile who is serving a life sentence. For more than 40 years, I was a loving friend to hundreds of little boys. I took them fishing, helping them with their homework and listening to their problems. Their parents never suspected that I was also having sex with them. Can we turn the keyboard on for me, please? You thought that your son was sleeping over at a friend's house that night. Well, he did, but it wasn't the friend that you thought. I know he told you that it was at Billy's. Your son was sleeping with me. You see, I'm the man down the street who hired him to mow the grass, who helped him with his homework while, while you were at work, who went to school and scout functions when neither you nor your father had the time. I also taught him some things that he didn't need to know, not yet anyway. Meeting boys was simpler than you might think. I never had to force or intimidate them or even offer them money or bribes. Most of them came along with me very willingly. Take, for example, a typical Saturday afternoon. Mom is busy with the younger children or maybe away at some social engagement. Dad is playing golf or working and perhaps he doesn't even live with the family anymore. The boy feels lonely and unwanted at home and he comes to the mall just to wander. From where I'm sitting on the bench in the middle of the mall concourse, the boy can't help but see me when he leaves the video arcade. See, earlier I was there too and we made eye contact and even spoke a few casual words. I chose him to talk to because he seemed quiet and he was alone. Now he sees me again and as he walks along looking in the store windows and within 10 or 20 paces he glances back. Now he's at the pet shop and perhaps the bookstore. I, I head over casually making a friendly remark about the merchandise. He smiles shyly. He's always been taught not to talk to strangers. But I've smiled and chatted and shown some interest in him. See, I'm not really a stranger anymore. I offer to buy him a hamburger or a slice of pizza. He may hesitate, but finally he smiles and agrees. And from then on, he's mine. I went through dozens of these affairs. I especially like blue-eyed blondes. Preferably ones who are intelligent and polite, neat and nicely dressed. Many of these boys were members of large families, and they cut across all class levels. I've intimately known the sons of a senator, a general, a physician, assistant city manager, and more. Boys who had an emotional rather than economical need for a friend like me. They were easy to control and very more loyal. Some of my relationships lasted several years. To keep a boy's friendship, I offered him very little beyond what he should have found at home. Someone who would listen, who would cheer him on in school and sports. Occasionally I took the boys to the movie or camping trip or played cards with them for an hour. I truly enjoyed spending time with them. And I knew what they would offer me, the chance to feel whole and comfortable and needed. It's difficult to say whether the boys enjoyed the sex with me or just tolerated it in exchange for the attention that they craved. 
The vast majority, I believe, were not gay. They simply accommodated my wish in order to remain close to me. John was such a boy, typical of so many that I was with. At 15, he was the eldest child in a big family and was expected to take care of himself. But John wanted more. He needed someone to tell him he was doing well, to pat him on the back, play a game of tennis or catch. He wanted to be able to tell somebody when he was feeling low and to be comforted instead of being told to take it like a man. I really never feared any boy ever turning me into the police. So what can a parent do to protect her son from a molester? Well, traumatizing a child with an abnormal fear of strangers probably won't do much good since the one who seeks to seduce him may already be his friend. Precautions are especially hard to take in a society that allows boys great freedom in choosing activities and friends, but severely limits them in displays of emotion. A boy who isn't getting the affection and recognition he craves is at greatest risk. If, a, if as a parent you can be a friend to your child, a compassionate soul who will listen to him and take him seriously, you'll make him less vulnerable to a man like me. Proverbs 19.22 says, What a man desires is unfailing love. Let me tell you something. We have a generation of children and, and young adults who have been labeled as rubbish. They're fatherless, they're badgered, they're bruised, they're left for trash. But God's called us to be the Mordecais, who will take them into our hearts, who will love them unconditionally, and with the authority that God's given to us, fashion and form and mold them to find their destiny, to speak into their life words of faith and truth, correction and hope and to impart our very convictions into their lives. And it's as simple as learning a lesson from a pedophile, spend a little time and loving them unconditionally. Father, I ask, Lord, that you would burn a fresh vision in each of our hearts. Lord, for our children, Lord, I know that these children pastors are often overlooked. And what an awesome privilege that they can even just get away for a little while and be nurtured and ministered to. And I pray in the next couple of days that you would plant such fresh vision in their heart. Lord, that they would see that they're not just taking care of little children. But Lord, they're shaping America. They're shaping our future. Father, let them recognize that they're the heroes of the church. Maybe most of the church don't even know their name. Don't even know they exist. Maybe everybody thinks the hero is the senior pastor. But Father, I ask that you would help them to see in your eyes their value. I ask, Lord, that you would help us not to grow weary in well-doing, not to get discouraged or disgruntled or hurt because we don't get recognition or support. But Father, to take the children that you give to us and to form them and to fashion them, to love them, become spiritual mom and dads to them. Lord, that we might direct their destiny for you. Use us, Lord, to see their destiny fulfilled. Father, I speak it in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.